Have you ever pondered the origins of our species Homo sapiens? Where did we come from and how did we evolve to become the dominant species on Earth? The answers to these questions take us on a fascinating journey, back to a time when humans were far from the top of the food chain. Around 150,000 years ago humans were still marginal creatures. Despite having harnessed the power of fire, our ancestors were far from the dominant species they would eventually become. There were perhaps a million humans in total scattered from the Indonesian archipelago to the Iberian Peninsula. They were a mere blip on the ecological radar. Among these early humans were our own ancestors, Homo sapiens. They were present on the world stage but they were largely confined to a corner of Africa. The exact location and time of their evolution from earlier human species is unknown, but by 150,000 years ago, East Africa was populated by Homo sapiens that looked just like us. They had smaller teeth and jaws than their ancestors thanks to the use of fire, but they had impressively large brains, equal in size to ours. Around 70,000 years ago these Homo sapiens began to spread. They moved from East Africa into the Arabian Peninsula and from there they quickly spread across the entire Eurasian landmass. But they were not alone. Most of Eurasia was already populated by other human species, so what happened to these other humans? The answer lies in two opposing theories the interbreeding theory and the replacement theory. The interbreeding theory suggests that as Homo sapiens spread into Neanderthal territories, they didn't just overpower and replace them. Instead, they intermingled and interbred, leading to a merging of the two populations. If this theory holds true, then modern-day Eurasians aren't pure Homo sapiens. They are a mix of sapiens and Neanderthals. Similarly, when sapiens reached East Asia, they interbred with the local Homo erectus, Thus, according to this theory, the Chinese and Koreans are a mixture of Sapiens and Erectus. The replacement theory, on the other hand, paints a starkly contrasting picture. This theory posits that Sapiens and other human species had different anatomies, mating habits, and possibly even different body odors. This would have made them less likely to interbreed. Even if a Sapiens and a Neanderthal did mate, their offspring, this theory argues, would likely have been infertile due to the vast genetic differences between the two species. This means that the two populations remained distinct, and when the Neanderthals died out, their genes died with them. According to this view, all contemporary humans can trace their lineage back exclusively to East Africa, 70,000 years ago. In this scenario, we are all pure Homo sapiens. These theories aren't just academic musings, they carry significant implications. If the replacement theory is correct, then all living humans share the same genetic baggage, and racial distinctions are negligible. But if the interbreeding theory is right, there could be genetic differences between Africans, Europeans, and Asians that go back hundreds of thousands of years. For decades, the replacement theory ruled the roost. It had stronger archaeological backing and was more politically palatable. However, in 2010, the results of a four-year effort to map the Neanderthal genome were published. The findings sent shockwaves through the scientific community. It turns out that 1 to 4% of the unique human DNA of modern populations in the Middle East and Europe is Neanderthal DNA. That's not a massive amount, but it's significant. Take a moment to digest that. Your ancestors mine all of us carry within us a small piece of a species that walked this earth over 40,000 years ago, but the surprises don't stop there. DNA extracted from a fossilized finger from Denisova revealed that up to 6% of the unique human DNA of modern Melanesians and Aboriginal Australians is Denisovan DNA. So what does this mean? Are we more Neanderthal than we thought, or perhaps more Denisovan? It's critical to remember that these results, while fascinating, are still under investigation. Further research may reinforce or modify these conclusions. Despite these findings, it's not to say that the replacement theory, the idea that modern humans replaced all other human species without interbreeding, is entirely incorrect. Neanderthals and Denisovans only contributed a small amount of DNA to our present-day genome, making it impossible to speak of a merger between Homo sapiens and other human species. The biological relatedness of sapiens, Neanderthals, and Denisovans is a complex puzzle. They were not entirely different species like horses and donkeys, nor were they merely different populations of the same species, like bulldogs and spaniels. Biological reality, it appears, is not as black and white as we might like to think. About 50,000 years ago, sapiens, Neanderthals, and Denisovans were at a borderline point. They were almost separate species yet still capable on rare occasions of producing fertile offspring. 
The populations did not merge, but a few fortunate Neanderthal genes hitched a ride on the Sapiens Express. It's both unsettling and thrilling to think that we sapiens could once have had children with an individual from a different species. But, if the Neanderthals, Denisovans and other human species didn't merge with sapiens, why did they vanish? One theory suggests that Homo sapiens drove them to extinction. As sapiens began to hunt and gather in the same territories, their superior technology and social skills allowed them to multiply and spread, potentially leading to the decline of the Neanderthals and Denisovans. Picture a band of sapiens reaching a Balkan valley, a place where Neanderthals had thrived for hundreds of thousands of years. The sapiens began to hunt the deer, gather the nuts and berries that were once the Neanderthals' primary source of sustenance. Armed with superior technology and social skills, the sapiens were more proficient hunters and gatherers. As they multiplied and spread, the less resourceful Neanderthals found it increasingly challenging to feed themselves. Their population dwindled, and they slowly faded from existence. Perhaps a few might have joined their sapien neighbors, but the majority vanished. Another theory suggests that the competition for resources led to violence and perhaps genocide. Tolerance unfortunately is not a sapien's trademark. A slight difference in skin color, dialect or religion even today, can prompt one group of sapiens to exterminate another. Would ancient sapiens have been more tolerant towards an entirely different human species? It's possible that the encounter between sapiens and Neanderthals resulted in the first and most significant ethnic cleansing campaign in history. The disappearance of Neanderthals and other human species poses one of history's greatest what-ifs. Imagine a world where Neanderthals or Denisovans survived alongside Homo sapiens. What kind of cultures, societies and political structures would have emerged? How would religious faiths have unfolded? Would Neanderthals have been able to serve in the Roman legions, or in the sprawling bureaucracy of imperial China? Over the past 10,000 years, Homo sapiens have grown so accustomed to being the only human species that it's hard for us to conceive of any other possibility. Our lack of brothers and sisters makes it easier to imagine that we are the epitome of creation, and that a chasm separates us from the rest of the animal kingdom. Yet, had the Neanderthal survived would we still imagine ourselves to be a creature apart? Perhaps this is exactly why our ancestors wiped out the Neanderthals. They were too familiar to ignore but too different to tolerate. There were others, brothers and sisters of our kind sharing the world with us. But today, they are no more than echoes of a bygone era, their existence reduced to skeletal remains, stone tools and fragments of DNA within us. The Homo soloensis, our distant relatives, vanished from the face of the earth around 50,000 years ago. Following closely on their heels were the Homo Denisova, who disappeared shortly thereafter. Neanderthals, those strong brainy beings with a knack for survival in the harshest climates, made their exit roughly 30,000 years ago. And the last of the dwarf-like humans, those that inhabited Flores Island, said their final goodbyes about 12,000 years ago. Why did these other human species go extinct? Was it a result of our arrival? Or were other factors at play? This question has intrigued and puzzled scientists for ages. The evidence suggests a grim possibility that our ancestors might have played a role in their extinction. The Neanderthals, for instance, were eerily similar to us, yet distinctly different. This paradox might have been too much for our ancestors to bear. Could this be why they were wiped out? It's a chilling hypothesis, but one that holds water. So how did we, Homo sapiens, manage to survive and thrive, while our brethren faded into oblivion? What was our secret weapon? The answer could be found in the very thing that sets us apart from the rest of the animal kingdom, our unique language. This unparalleled tool allowed us to cooperate flexibly in large groups, enabling us to adapt and conquer diverse habitats rapidly. The debate continues to rage, and the truth may be buried deep within our shared history. But one thing is clear, our journey as a species has been a solitary one. We, Homo sapiens, are the last remaining human species, survivors in an evolutionary lottery. This solitude, while it may seem triumphant, also serves as a stark reminder of our past and the mysteries it still holds. So the next time you marvel at the complexity of human civilization, remember that we are but a single branch on the vast tree of life, a solitary leaf fluttering in the winds of time.